20 years ago, a group of scientists decided to find out if there were other paradises out there, so-called exoplanets, orbiting the stars that light up our night sky. Just in the last decade, we've had this explosion in the discovery of these exoplanets, which has revolutionized the whole field of astronomy. The early days of exoplanet hunting turned up enormous Jupiter-sized planets by the boatload. These hot, gassy giants proved easy to find, but hostile to life as we know it. Now, though, new telescopes and technologies have allowed astronomers to target smaller planets, Earth-sized ones, and the stunning results have transformed the way we see our place in the universe. We now know something precious, that our planet Earth is not unique. It's not even rare. There are tons, hordes, flocks, if you will, of other Earth-like planets out there fluttering around the other stars. Some stars probably have multiple Earths orbiting them. That's how common Earth-like planets are. We owe this exoplanet explosion to a space telescope called Kepler. The Kepler Space Telescope is an observatory in space that is staring at one spot in the sky. It's looking at roughly 150,000 stars, and it's looking for the telltale sign of planets orbiting those stars. Then every time the planet passes in front of the star, it'll block a little bit of that starlight. And if you plot the amount of light you get from the star, it drops and then goes back up as the planet passes. In just four years, scientists have detected over a thousand exoplanets just from their shadows. It can't tell if the shadow is made by a giant gassy planet hostile to life or a potentially habitable Earth-like planet. What we're measuring when a, when a planet passes in front of its host star is what is the area of the planet relative to the area of the star that it's passing in front of. It's a, it's a ratio, basically. Big Jupiter-sized planets crossing giant stars fool Kepler because they block the same fraction of light as Earth-sized planets crossing smaller stars. To prove a planet is Earth-sized, you need to measure the size of its star first using the world's biggest telescopes. But it's time-consuming, expensive, and creates a huge exoplanet backlog. But astronomer Kayvon Stassen has come up with an ingenious shortcut by turning the raw Kepler data into sound. What the Kepler telescope directly measures and the data that we use is the small changes in brightness that a star produces due to the flickering uh, arising from the boiling and roiling motions of gas at its surface. What we can do then is take that light flickering data and transform it in a sound studio, for example, into audio frequencies. And so then we can represent with sound what we're actually detecting with light. The bigger the star is, the more its surface boils with activity, making big stars flicker more powerfully. Converted to sound, this boiling becomes a deafening hiss. Well, let's listen to some stars. Okay. Can we hear the red giant star, please? Yeah. I'm going to bring up the volume here. This is a very large star, very low density. And so that large amount of hiss is the result of vigorous boiling and churning at the surface of this large red giant star. Can we get the dwarf star, please? Yeah. On smaller stars, sunspots dominate the sound profile, creating a low-frequency drone. It actually sounds like a series of clicks. Krrr. Beneath the clicks lies the faint hiss needed to size the star. 
underneath it, at a very low level, is a little bit of hiss. That little bit of is actually the light flickering that we're interested in. By accurately measuring the level of this background hiss, Kavon can work out the size of the star. In this case, it's around the same size as our star, the Sun. Kavon's work could be the breakthrough exoplanet hunters have been hoping for. It's cheap, the results are practically instantaneous, and once you know the size of the star, it's child's play to work out the size of the planet casting shadows over it. It, it feels like a very privileged time to be a scientist, to be an astronomer uh, working in this area and contributing to the hunt for the next Earth. Here we are actually discovering these worlds by the hundreds and now on the cusp of being able to identify the next Earth. Astronomers suspect there could be tens of billions of rocky Earth-like planets in the Milky Way, places where perhaps life has gotten a foothold. But life as we know it requires water. How can scientists possibly find this miracle substance on planets light years away? Water divides our living world. Those with it prosper, those without suffer. Remarkably, the water we drink today contains the same atoms as the water dinosaurs drank 100 million years ago. It's the same water that formed clouds over the early Earth four billion years ago and every organism that has ever existed on Earth has used this single ration of water as the biochemical powerhouse that keeps it alive. On Earth, all life requires liquid water to grow and reproduce. It's the common ecological requirement for life. Liquid water is just so good for getting evolution going. Molecules can dissolve in the water, actually interact with each other, form more complex chains. It does it with charge. There's positive charges and negative charges separated between the hydrogen and the oxygen in H2O. Those charges break apart the hydrocarbons, the carbon-based molecules that persist everywhere in nature. Now that's very rare. Hardly any other liquids do that. So liquid water is a natural starting place when you look out into the universe and say, what planets could possibly have life? To understand how much liquid water is out there, astronomers must first calculate how common water is in all its forms. Amazingly, they find it everywhere they look. Water is incredibly common. In its gaseous form, we see water vapor filling the space between the stars. We see it in clouds of material that are actually forming new stars and planets right now. Since water is a fundamental building block of stars and planets, then exoplanet worlds must surely have it in abundance. But if you're looking for life, you need to find liquid water and plenty of it. To find it, astronomers take their cue from a fairy tale. Everybody knows the famous story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears and the, the cup of porridge where one was too hot, one was too cold, one was just right. When it comes to cooking up life like a porridge, you need to have an environment that's not too hot, not too cold, just right. And traditionally, we look for that at a certain distance around a star. At first, astronomers based this magical distance, known as the Goldilocks zone, on the Earth's orbit around the sun. But as they've found more and more exoplanets, they've had to reevaluate the boundaries for liquid water. There isn't a single distance. It depends on the brightness of your parent star. A dim star, you need to be closer. A hot star, very bright, you need to be farther away. 
Scientists have calculated how many rocky planets may lie within the Goldilocks zone of the stars. It comes out to over 30 billion potentially watery worlds. Even more remarkably, recent discoveries have shown us it's not just planets that can bask in the warmth of the Goldilocks zone. There may be moons painted blue with oceans too.